Hello, Burn listeners, and also to our Burn viewers on the YouTube channel. I'm here with Seth Goldstein from Turntable FM. He's the chairman of Turntable FM, the addictive social game that has taken the world by storm. And I have to say that we have also played it in our Burn meetings, and we we can't get enough of it. We really couldn't concentrate at the last one. Um, if For those of you who don't know, Turntable FM it really functions like a uh, real-life party, DJs, audience and the exchange of great music so i think i just want to go back to the basics how did the, the ideas start for you for this turntable event um so i'm blessed with a great partner billy um jason who's a ceo and uh this is something he'd had in the back of his mind for a while um and so i think he had a really clear picture of a certain kind of experience where people would go into a virtual room and play music with their friends and essentially what he coded a year ago is what we have and we've improved it but the fundamental dynamics are pretty straightforward I mean it's fun it's meant to be fun it doesn't take itself too seriously um, there's some really elegant social dynamics built in in terms of peer pressure um, and narcissism when you play music that you you know you play great music you want to share it with your friends when you share it with your friends the service gets bigger I just wanted to ask because you had so many startups before uh, Turntable FM, like um, Majestic Research, Root Market, Sticky Bits. Um, what have you learned from the other startups, and what have you applied to this one? Or I don't know if were there any challenges you faced in that one that you kind of applied to this one? Were there? Um, I think product comes first. Um, having a great product. Um, having the right ratio of coders to non-coders. Um, I moved from New York to Silicon Valley about five, six years ago. Um, so I really appreciate the power of, um, you know, two developers with no distractions for eight weeks to build something that goes up and to the right, or the metrics go up and to the right. Um, without that, it's it's very hard to succeed unless you're in a services business. Mm -hmm. um, and insofar as we're trying to create consumer internet companies, um, it, it really does come first. Um, I, I think I've learned that the hard way over the years. And um, I wanted to say, because we're as business students, uh, we read uh, like books as from Jim Collins, for example, and he talks about getting the right people on board. How um, I know that I have a lot of friends that have started startups, and they usually started them with friends. And I found like that friendships don't really provide the most efficient like worth et ethic. Like, what are your hiring guidelines for a startup or at least what kind of personalities or uh, what are you looking for? Um, so I think in general, when you start a company with one or two or three people, um, it's important that you complement each other. It's also important that you wear lots of hats. What quickly happens, which, frust which, which I think frustrates um, a lot of companies, is you go from wanting generalists to specialists fairly quickly. So the faster you grow, the faster you need to move from somebody who you know, does lots of things decently to people that need to do one thing well, mm -hmm. right? So typically, you get to a certain stage and, um, you know, the, the person that was doing product and engineering and um, project management um, doesn't do any one of those particularly well. So you need three new people and you need to get that person out. Um, as I say, um, you know, it's kind of Machiavellian, but you got to hire slow and fire fast. And the minute you know that someone's not working out, it rarely gets better. So you got to move on. Um, founder dynamics are tricky. Um, it's like a marriage. You, you've got to really communicate uh, th and through the conflict that you, you're going to face. Um, that's just a couple lessons. And uh, my last question, because we're not going to keep you long, um, is, of course, you've been reluctant a little bit in the uh, in, in your speech to say something about the future of Turntable, but at least Turntable FM, but at least something about opening up new frontiers, maybe other continents. You said that may be possible in the future, in a few years, um, especially Europe's where Spotify came from. I think there are a lot of people, I'm from Europe as well, so we're very engaged into all these social and internet sort of lifestyle. Do you think anything like that will happen? Oh yeah, no, I, I'm, we'll have, the UK and Europe open up probably first in Canada. 
um, Latin America, certain areas in, uh, of Asia will take longer. And um, I wanted to also ask if you will expand with other companies maybe here or um, not, I don't know, horizontally, but like expand with other um, products or companies or find maybe YouTube or, you know, th that, that sort of idea or other platforms. I mean, we'll open up to new platforms like Android and, and iPads. Uh, I think in general, we'll start to make it easier to um, lean back and listen as opposed to only having to lean forward and play. Um, currently, even if you're just a listener in a room, it's fairly engaged. I mean, the only criticism we've had from people is it's too addictive, it's too engaging, and they can't get any work done. Um, <laughs> You can't really listen to turntable in the background, so I think we'll make it easier for that to happen. Cool. Thank you very much for this interview and for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>